The next axis is by my ticket. How much time do you need to do? 16. 16 minutes. 16. 1 6. Yes, sir. 6 percent. Good morning, Your Excellency. Through the course of the next 16 minutes, I, the co agent on behalf of the applicants representing Mandova in this particular case, seek to establish in this court that diplomatic immunity can be invoked by Mandova on behalf of its diplomat. Your Excellency, I will establish this by proving two submissions before this honorable court. Number one, the issue that caused the inviolability that is guaranteed under Article 29 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961 has been violated by Islam. And number two, diplomatic immunity that is guaranteed under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961 has been violated. Your Excellencies, if you may please move to page number 37 of the written submissions where, and subsequently page number 14 of the written submissions where uh, this issue has been dealt with. The next thing, it is the primary submission of the applicants in this case that by arresting the diplomat, Hindustan has violated Article 29 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961. Personal inviolability is guaranteed under Article 29 and as per this principle, which is given in page 37 of the the person of a diplomatic agent shall be inviolable. He shall not be liable to any form of arrest or detention. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, inviolability is the oldest established rule of diplomatic law and it re-emphasizes the fact that the envoy shall be immune from any form of arrest or detention. Furthermore, Your Excellency, Article 30 of the same BCDR stipulates that the papers, correspondence and the property of the envoy shall then enjoy inviolability. The word property in this regard has been interpreted by many jurists to also include the motor car of the envoy. Your Excellencies, in the, uh, if you may please turn to page number uh, 38 of the written submissions. The very honourable court in the hostages case of 1980 held that the inaction of the Iranian government faced with the detention and imprisonment of US diplomatic and consular staff over an extended period constituted a clear and serious violation of Article 29. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, in the 2002 judgment of this very honourable court in the arrest warrants case, it was held that the issuance of an arrest warrant under universal jurisdiction by Belgium violated the personal inviolability that is guaranteed to the diplomat of Congo. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, the very honourable court in the 2005 judgment of Congo versus Uganda held that the uh, maltreatment by Congo forces of persons within the Ugandan embassy constituted a violation of Article 29 insofar as such persons were diplomats. The basic establishing principle here is that Article 29 which guarantees personal inviolability and establishes the, establishes the fact that the diplomatic agent cannot be arrested is recognized by this very honourable court and is also recognized by treaties, customs and conventions. However, Your Excellencies, at this point, the applicants do submit that there are certain exceptions to the principle of inviolability as has been discharged by the international community. If the bench may please turn to page number 39 of the written submission. This very honourable court in the hostages case held that the observance of the principle of inviolability did not mean that a diplomatic agent caught in the act of committing an assault or other offence may not on occasion be briefly arrested by the police of the receiving state in order to prevent the commission of the crime at that particular time. Your Excellencies, it is submitted that this Honourable Court has held certain exceptions to the principle of inviolability. It is our submission at this stage that even the exceptions to the principle of personal inviolability are not applicable in this particular case of arresting a diplomatic agent and hence the first submission of arresting Why, why it is not clear in this case, personal inviolability? What is the reason behind this? Thank you for your question, Your uh, Excellency. As held by this Honourable Court in the hostages case, a diplomat can only be arrested when he is in the process of committing an offence or an assault. In this case, as per the factual rating given, if the diplomat goes on his way back to the airport, hence he is not in the process of committing any offence and as per the rules established... What is the definition of offence? Your Excellency, uh, the definition of offence may differ from legal system to legal system, but the basic uh, outline of offence is committing an act which is not uh, allowed or authorised by the criminal or civil court of that Only act or omission is also included. Uh, Your Excellency, an act or omission which is prohibited by the laws of that particular country. Thank you for your question, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, what is the process of escape from the 
Your, your Excellency, it is all sufficient in this issue that the diplomat on his way back to the airport is not in the process of committing any act or any offence. Hence, the exceptions laid down to the principle of personal inviolability do not apply in this particular case. To answer your question as to the escaping or per day 20 offence or not, I will go, I will deal with that in my subsequence of issue of diplomatic immunity. But Your Excellency, it is pleaded before this honourable court that with respect to this sub issue, it is submitted that arresting the diplomat when he is not committing the offence is a violation of personal inviolability guaranteed under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, Article 29. Furthermore, Your Excellency, as has been stated in the factual meetings, uh, this exception does not apply and hence it is all uh, primary submission here that the, uh, the acts of the respondents in this town in arresting the diplomat is a violation of his personal inviolability. Furthermore, Your Excellency, if you may please move uh, to page number 40, this incident, the exception was tried by Sweden in 1988, wherein the Yugoslav ambassador to Sweden was seen lying under a blanket in a sandpit and was brandishing a pistol. In this case, he was in the process of committing an offence or, offense or an assault and hence he was arrested. Furthermore, arrests also involve uh, diplomats driving under the abuse of alcohol or other situations where they are in the process of committing an offence. Here it is reaffirmed and reiterated that the diplomatic agent is not in the process of committing an offence and hence arrest cannot be justified. If your excellencies may please refer to page number 40 of the written submission. The second sub-issue wherein diplomatic immunity is absolute and can be invoked is being spoken about. Your Excellencies, it is our primary submission here that diplomatic immunity is guaranteed under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. If you may please refer to page 14. A diplomatic agent shall enjoy immunity from the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. Your Excellencies, in the hostage case of 1980, the very honourable ICJ held that uh, they held and laid emphasis on the importance of immunity from criminal jurisdiction by ruling that if the intention to submit the hostages to any form of criminal trial or investigation were to be put into effect, that would constitute a grave breach by Iran of its obligations under Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the 1961 Convention. The basic point that is being held by the International Court of Justice in the hostages case is that if the diplomatic agent is envisaged to be subject to any form of trial or any other provisions within the criminal code of that receiving state, it would be a violation of Article 31, Paragraph 1 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, which held which states that diplomatic immunity is absolute when it comes to the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, it is submitted that this principle of diplomatic immunity is absolute and is customary international law. As we can see, uh, even before codifying of the Vienna Convention, it was, was practiced by states of US and other states of UK, Australia and France and it has been uh, opined by jurists such as Ms. Irene Delza, who is an authority on diplomatic law, that diplomatic immunity is customary international law in nature. Furthermore, it is important to note that there has been no circumstance where a diplomat has been subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. Hence, Your Excellencies, it is respectfully submitted that as per the primary sources of international law guaranteed under Article 13 of this very statute, to be customs and uh, conventions, the diplomatic immunity is absolute in nature and cannot be violated. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, I mean, uh, do you think that, that uh, this court has to be your Excellencies, uh, if your if your uh, Excellency can please refer to the last page of the company. No, uh, Your Excellency, I apologize. If your Excellency can please refer to page of uh, paragraph number forty-eight of the company, which states that the parties agreed to submit these matters to the International Court of Justice under a special agreement pursuant to Article thirty-six, paragraph one of the ICJ statute. Paragraph 48 of the uh, uh, moot problem here, Excellency. After, after these diplomatic exchanges, the two governments tried to negotiate but failed to resolve the dispute bilaterally on the application and invocation of diplomatic immunity. Now, the parties agreed to submit these matters to the International Court of Justice. Pursuant to Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute, which states, Your uh, Excellencies, would you like me to read Article 36? No, proceed. How much of the Excellencies? Thank you for your question. 
The expense is it is the submission, it is the contention of the respondents in this town in this regard at this point that when they arrested the diplomat, the diplomatic note was sent to Mandova, which claimed that diplomatic immunity is a walking principle under international law, as as mentioned in uh, paragraph 47 of the compromise. The expense is it is submitted that the claim of change circumstances of Hindustan cannot be accorded any recognition and diplomatic immunity has to be recognized as a principle as was already recognized and cannot be derogated from. The expense is if you may please turn to page number 42 of the written submission. This very honorable court in the hostages case of 1980 described the rules of diplomatic law and the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations of 1961 to be a self-contained regime. Your Excellency, by this, the International Court meant that the provisions of the VCPR within the VCPR to tackle the problems of abuse of diplomatic immunity, which set perhaps the most important base for establishing change circumstances, can be effectively countered within the provisions of the VCPR itself, as has been described in the ICJ in the Hostages case of 1980. Why instances of abuse are condemnable your expenses? It is submitted that there exists within the VCBR plenty of redressal, namely six redressals which have been identified by the applicants and which will be assisted to the court, wherein the receiving state under instances of abuse of diplomatic immunity can employ those provisions to counter these problems and instances of abuse of diplomatic immunity. Your Excellencies, at this point, I'd like to establish the six redressals. The first and perhaps the most important redressal, as has been given in page number 42 of the written submission, is under Article 9 of the VCBR 1961, wherein the receiving state may declare the diplomat to be a persona non grata. By this, Your Excellency, basically, the receiving state, by declaring the diplomatic agent a persona non grata, he has to vacate the receiving state at the earliest. And jurists such as Mr. Malcolm Shaw and Mr. Ian Brownlee have opined that a receiving state declaring a diplomatic agent to be persona non grata is perhaps the gravest form of countering the abuse of diplomatic immunity. Your Excellencies, state practice denotes that declaring someone persona non grata is an effective measure to tackle the problem of abuse of diplomatic immunity. If you may please refer to the last lines of page number 42 of the written submission. In 2011, and court, Russia declared Israel's military attaché to Moscow persona non grata as he was caught receiving secret information from a Russian citizen. Furthermore, in 2016, which is not mentioned in the written submission in Excellency, but in 2016, a Bangladeshi diplomat to Pakistan was declared persona non grata due to her abuse of diplomatic immunity. Your Excellency, this is the first redressal available as per the VCDR. Secondly, Your Excellency, under Article 32 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations 1961, the sending state may waive diplomatic immunity in an express manner, which allows the receiving state to try the diplomat in the jurisdiction of the receiving state. Your Excellency, this has been practiced in two uh, state practice also denotes applica uh, application of Article 32. But a very uh, one example is wherein Mr. Dismay Khan, a diplomat in Wellington of Zimbabwe, was accused of offences and his diplomatic immunity was waived. In the year 2014, New Zealand has waived immunity 13 out of 62 times. And this shows us that states are also employing measures of Article 32 to counter the abuse <laughs> of diplomatic immunity. Your Excellency, it is also submitted that the, the sending state may try the diplomat within their own jurisdiction. At this point, it is extremely clear to understand that diplomatic immunity is a procedural bar. It is not a mechanism which exempts the diplomat from the substantive liability of the law which is involved in question. Your Excellency, it is submitted that the, the process of diplomatic immunity only prevents the diplomat to be tried in the criminal jurisdiction of the receiving state. By no way does it say that the diplomat is exempted from the liability he incurs in his acts or offences. Hence, another redressal available is to try the diplomat in the jurisdiction of the sending state. Perhaps the most gravest of circumstances can also be countered by severing diplomatic relations with the receiving state and the sending state as has been applied by state in April 1984, mentioned in page number 43 of the written submission, Your Excellency. Can you justify if, if uh, the person will be deported? Your Excellency, the factual... You will be punished and you will be, uh, you will be persecuted by the law of Mandova? Your Excellency, uh, the agents of the uh, of Mandova at this point, 
or at this point state that they have sovereign rights to try the diplomatic agent of Mandova in Mandova and in the jurisdiction of Mandova. However, the factual matrix is silent as to whether he has been declared a persona non grata by Hindustan. However, Hindustan has the sovereign rights to declare this diplomatic agent or any diplomatic agent persona non grata because Article 9 allows Hindustan or any other sovereign state to declare someone persona non grata without any reason at all. Your Excellencies, government speaks. Absolute immunity in respect of criminal jurisdiction. 
But in the event they are consistent objectors to this principle, customary international law will come into the question and customary international law is on the side of applicants because immunity from criminal jurisdiction is absolute as guaranteed by our customary international law and state practice. Uh, are you sure that there is no provision in the agreement between the Mandava and Hindustan that the immunity and privileges should be guaranteed under any circumstances? Any, 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 your Excellency, your Excellency, uh, it is our submission will be twofold in this regard. Number one, uh, there is no outline explicit agreement between Hindustan and Mandova which states that diplomatic immunity is not uh, absolute. And number two, it is submitted that there have been grave offences committed and seen by the international framework. And even in those grave offences of a diplomat raping 15 women at gunpoint, diplomatic immunity has been guaranteed to be absolute in the criminal jurisdiction. And hence, in this case, it is submitted that immunity is absolute in nature. And just to clarify, Your Excellency, the applicants, Mandova, are not standing before the Honorable Court and its Honorable Bench justifying the acts of the immunity of the diplomat. They are only arguing that diplomatic immunity is absolute and has been by So come to your prayer. Uh, much of the Therefore, in light of our facts stated, authorities cited, arguments advanced, and averments made, the applicants and agents for the, uh, uh, the, the agents for the applicants most humbly and respectfully request the court to guarantee the following uh, release. Number one, with respect to the issue of diplomatic immunity, that diplomatic immunity cannot be removed and can be applied in this particular case. With respect to the arguments covered by my co-agent, number one, the International Court of Justice has the jurisdiction so to have, 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 have submitted three, three points and you, you are submitting the last point. Your, your Excellency, uh, I will be submitting the last two points. Number one, Hindustan has violated its, uh, any of its uh, international law obligations. And number two, diplomatic immunity is absolute in nature and it cannot be revoked in any set of change circumstances. Your Excellency, it was an honor of giving the court Your Excellency, representing the respondents before this honorable court today, this is Agent 1 from Team SMCI01, along with Co Agent 2, pursuant to Article 42 of the ICJ Statute. With the permission of the court, I shall be reserving 16 minutes for submitting in the case between the Kingdom of Himalayan State versus the Republic of Hindustan and addressing the question of advisory opinion sought from the, by the United Nations Security Council. The next 16 minutes shall be reserved by my co-agent and we shall reserve 3 minutes for rebuttals. On the first issue, this court today must adjudicate on the question as claimed by the applicants whether the Republic of Hindustan can be made obliged to respect, to recognize and afford protection to the climate change refugees from KHS and whether the ICC should render its advisory opinion on the said issue or not. The respondents in this regard have brought three major arguments to refute the claims of the respond applicants. I beg Your Excellency's permission to enter into the first argument. The first argument submitted is that the migrants from the Kingdom of Himalayan states to the Republic of Hindustan are not entitled to protection as climate refugees and in any event Hindustan is not obliged to afford protection to them. Your Excellencies, climate change refugees do not fall within the ambit of the 1951 Convention related to the status of refugees whose Article 182 specifically defines refugees as someone with the well-founded fear of being persecuted on grounds of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Here, the earthquake-induced migrants from the Kingdom of Himalayan states cannot be identified as refugees due to the absence of the element of persecution on the basis of all these five grounds. Argumento, or alternatively, Your Excellencies, Hindustan is not even a signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees as evident from paragraph 34 of the Compromise, and hence it does not create any obligation on part of Hindustan pursuant to Article 34 of the Vienna Convention on on the law of treaties, also reflected by the maxim Pacta Tertis Nec Nocent Nec Prosut, that is, treaties do not create obligation for third states without their consent. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, Hindustan also cannot be made liable to afford protection to the migrants from KHS under customary international law, because both the requisite elements of consistent state practice and opinion jurist, as has been reaffirmed by this very court in several cases, 
including the North Sea Continental Shelf case 1969, as well as the military and paramilitary cases of 1984. Your Excellencies, it is evident from the shift in UNHCR, the primary agency concerned for the protection of refugees, of, U, of the uh, shift in policy of UNHCR of using the term environmentally displaced persons instead of environmental refugees, and from the statement by former High Commissioner of UNHCR, Mrs. Sadako Ogata, that UNHCR believes the term environmental refugees to be a misnomer, that there is no customary recognition of the term itself, and hence no consistent and uniform state practice can be established. The respondents next submit that the earthquake-induced migrants from the Kingdom of Himalayan states cannot be classified as climate change refugees in the first place. Your Excellencies, as provided in paragraph 37 of the Compromise, thousands of families of Kingdom of Himalayan states migrated to Hindustan after the earthquake of 2014. The link between climate change and earthquakes, as has been claimed by the IPCC and independent experts, are scientifically contentious because there is no consensus that the deglaciation caused by global warming influences the tectonic movement or fault lines to produce a high magnitude earthquake. Some argue that global warming can be responsible, while others, including Maggie Court, Baker, and Jared Kofi, argue that earthquake is a completely natural phenomenon. Hence, Your Excellency, in the absence of a definitive authority and in the absence of consensus regarding this very issue, the migrants of KHS are not climate change refugees. Furthermore, the, uh, the respondents would like to proceed to the next argument if the court permits. Your Excellencies, claims against Hindustan cannot be brought before this very court as for the doctrine of the exhaustion of local remedies. Your Excellencies, it is a well-established principle under customary international law that local remedies must be exhausted before international proceedings may be instituted, which has been reaffirmed in previous ICZ cases, including the interhandic case of Switzerland versus United States of America 1959, and also reaffirmed in international as well as regional human rights in instruments, including the ICCPR as well as the African Charter. Here, the doctrine of last resort seeks to preserve the long-standing principles of jurisdictional immunity and state sovereignty. As per this doctrine, the claims of violations of human rights as made by the applicants first have to be brought before a competent court within national jurisdiction that is in this time in this regard, which has clearly been not done here. Moreover, it can be inferred from the fact that the government of Hindustan arrested the diplomatic officer accused of grave violations of human rights that Hindustan is willing to comply with its human rights obligations and willing to afford protection to the victims uh, of grave violations of human rights. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, the ICZ has jurisdiction to hear cases that have been referred to it either by a special agreement pursuant to Article 40 of its statute or on the acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction as per Article 36 of its statute. Here, the Republic, in the case between the Kingdom of Himalayan States and the Republic of Hindustan, there has neither been any such special agreement nor has the Republic of Hindustan declared the acceptance of compulsory jurisdiction. Furthermore, since there is no breach of treaty or convention obligations, as the current international legal framework has not so far even recognized the term climate change refugees, the, uh, there is no question of international law. Next, it is submitted by the uh, uh, respondents that there are insufficient grounds for the clubbing of the dispute between the Kingdom of Himalayan State and the Republic of Hindustan with the advisory opinion as has been sought by the United Nations Security Council. Your Excellency, the jurisdiction of this court to hear contentious cases under Article 36 of its statute and the jurisdiction to render advisory opinion under Article 65 of its statute are two different jurisdictions. The conflation of two di divergent jurisdictions of I ICZ in this regard can lead to a, an unprecedented legal crisis by setting a wrong precedent, Your Excellency, because there are substantial differences between these two. Advisory opinions have no binding effect, whereas contentious cases judgment do as per Article 59 of the statute. Where it is mentioned in advisory opinion not, not, not binding. Sorry, Your Excellency. Where it is mentioned in any article, where advisory opinion is not binding, just you mentioned. Your Excellency, it is mentioned uh, in the uh, ICZ uh, 
how the court uh, within the ICC's website as well as in the rules of uh, procedure of its court, the council begs uh, ignorance on the specific rule, but it is mentioned in the rules of the court. Furthermore, Your Excellencies, there is only one extraordinary power ascribed to the ICC which relates to provisional measures, and it is not the case here. Furthermore, even in issues where advisory opinion and contentious pieces have had similar subject matter, this very court has not has not clubbed the issues. It has given the advisory opinion separately and judgment of merits is separately, as in Nicaragua case. The issues are same, but the court did not give same judgment on group, but it gave two different judgments on advisory opinion and merits case. Moreover, Your Excellencies, the court has jurisdiction, does not always mean that it is obliged to exercise it because the court always has a discretion in this matter. The respondents here submit that the, since the clubbing of these two issues, which are different because the issue of earthquake victims and climate refugees are different in the first place, there is no relevance of clubbing of it. Your Excellencies, the link between climate change and earthquakes, as uh, stated earlier by the respondent, it is it is scientifically contentious. Your Excellency, do you think that the earthquake has uh, the climate change has impact on earthquakes? Your Excellencies, there are, there is a huge different debate in the international fora on this very regard, and there are differing views. There are, there is no consensus argument, and in the lack of any authoritative source in this particular work, in this particular issue, this court does not have a authoritative basis in the form of a treaty or convention. Well, we are not going to uh, listen on this issue, but just tell me, yes, sir. tell us whether the victims of earthquake are facing threat to your state. Sorry, your excellency. Uh, victims of the earthquake. Yes. Entering into your country. Yes, your excellency. And they are uh, creating problem and they are creating a uh, threat to peace and security. And yes. hence, and hence uh, UNSC took the matter to the International Court of Justice for uh, its advisory opinion to take um, the course for that. Your Excellency, the major claim of the respondents is here is not whether the human rights of these people have been violated or not, or whether they pose a threat to Hindustan or not. It is The question here is whether Hindustan can be made liable to recognize them as climate change refugees and for protection accordingly in the absence of any normative framework which recognizes climate change refugees. No matter, no matter whether they are climate victim or they are victim of persecution or victim of anything, whatever. Yes, sir. But they are human rights are at stake and they mass exodus into your state and you have to support them for time being even to sort out whether the cause is real or not. In but here. you cannot say when well, if they are climate victims then you will support them, if they are uh, victim of uh, earthquake you will not support them. There is no choice even. In international human rights law and international obligation of the state is to protect whether he is national or international. Indeed, Your Excellencies, the prevalence, the protection of human rights always lies at the top of the issue. It is not contested by the respondents at all. But what is being contested is in this time alone being made liable for the people from Kingdom of Himalayan State who migrated by their own will into the uh, Republic of Hindustan as, as claimed by the applicants as climate change refugees. This is not the correct uh, platform to provide their rights to them. The correct way would be formation of a convention or a treaty which recognizes such people. Can you have any definition of what is uh, climate, climate change refugees? Climate refugees? Your, Your Excellency, there is no consenting definition, but one is uh, as provided by Mr. Frank Dearman and Ingrid Boas in their uh, in the article that climate change refugees have not had to define as people who have to leave their habitats immediately or in the near future because of sudden or gradual alterations in their natural environment related to at least one of the three impacts of climate change, namely sea level rise, extreme weather events, and drought and water scarcity. Your Excellencies, as per this very definition as well, earthquake victims do not fall within uh, these uh, criteria of sea rising sea level or extreme weather events or droughts because it is contested. It's not an exhaustive definition, it's an inclusive definition. So it's Sorry. Of this definition is inclusive, not exhaustive. So 
treatment or some more category. Indeed, your excellences, but the very point that respondents are putting forth this forward, this very honorable court, is there is no accepted de definition and there is no universal recognition of climate change refugees and which particular categories fall within them. So the proper way would be first framing up authoritative uh, declaration in the form of treaties or conventions which recognizes who climate change refugees are and what would be the responsibility of states rather than bringing claims against one particular in this state which is itself a developing country and which is uh, and where itself more than 30% of its people are living below the poverty line itself so being bringing responsibility on part of one state alone would not be the proper well, solution well, being, being a, uh, a neighboring country Yes, Your Excellency. The of, uh, yes, Your Excellency. And will you refer it to international uh, uh, matter or you as a neighboring country you have to put food neighborhood and you, you should address the matter? Your, ex Your Excellency, Hindustan has not violated the rights of its, its uh, of the people from the Kingdom of Himalayan State. It has merely stated that it would not provide them with refugee status because it has, not, it has stated that it would not provide refugee status to these people and these people as claimed by the applicants to be climate change refugees are not, do not fall within the ambit because the term climate change refugees in itself is in uh, controversy and there is no authority, there is no authority. As, as you refer, that there is definition on climate refugees, but then still there is no definition on earthquake Then what, as a state, what you should do? Whether you should look at law or you should look at the nature of justice. Your Excellency, the, the very question that this court must educate in this very in this particular case is whether Hindustan can be made liable. And since Hindustan has not even signed the Convention on the Status of Refugees, it is not even obliged. But and climate change refugees are not even covered by the definition of refugees of that convention, which is universally accepted, as well as there is no recog there is no consensus. And in the lack of, in the absence of a definite normative framework, this very court has, does not have the sufficient legal basis to render judgment by making Hindustan liable alone. Well, Hindustan is not liable as far as any specific instrument that you should say. But Hindustan is liable under the Charter of the International Convention. Hindustan is liable uh, as per core human rights instruments. Because of when there is no specific law, there is general law. And as per human charter, to support international peace and security, to respect human rights and dignity, to ensure international peace and security, every state should act as per Article 56 of the UN Charter, either separately or jointly with the nations. Indeed, Your Excellencies, but Hindustan has not violated any specific rights of these people till now. What can be there, there is a threat to violation and what is future, what is hypothetical, this court cannot render judgment. If and when Hindustan does such an action of violating their human rights, these applicants can bring the claims. But in this particular regard, it is uh, there is no such violation. Right? Thus, it is not necessarily it should be violated, but necessarily it should be protected. Indeed, your excellencies, but making Hindustan liable alone on the grounds of climate change refugees is what is being contested by the respondents. The respondents are, do agree unconditionally that human rights need to be protected, Your Excellencies. May I proceed, Your Excellencies? Therefore, Your Excellencies, it is pleaded before this honorable court to not make Hindustan alone responsible for the protection of climate change refugees in the absence of any normative legal framework in the form of treaty, convention, or precedence of, the, of this court because the only relevant authorities, that is, opinions of authors, are again very controversial in this regard and this court adjudicates not on the basis of lex parada, that is what law ought to be, but rather lex lata, what law is, which is absent in this particular case. Thank you, Your Excellencies. It was an honor to be before this court. I invite my co-agent now.